Welcome everybody. Uh, so, so good to see you, even if it is virtually. Um, this is our first Zoom talk um, in the history of JAM. And um, I think it's been prompted very much by the fact that um, we haven't seen you. And although we've been sending out newsletters and Instagrams, uh, we thought um, uh, if we gave a talk on Zoom, it'd be a chance for us to sort of catch up. Um, so what we thought that we would run a series of talks on our art travels in 2019 and um, uh, we we're very fortunate uh, that we actually managed to have three short trips uh, as against our one long trip and uh, we ended up going in uh, to Hong Kong uh, followed by Japan and after that we went to Shanghai and we're going to give a talk on each of these uh, for you. Um, so tonight we're going to start with Hong Kong so um, we're going to go to our screen uh, Okay, so um, the motivation to go to Hong Kong was actually to attend the um, um, the Art Basel uh, Hong Kong Art Fair, and um, and it was only a short trip. We we're only there for five days, and uh, as you'll see, we packed a lot into five days. And um, so let's start off with Hong Kong itself. So. Um, We've been quite a few times to Hong Kong. I think the first time we went in the 80s and, um, and it, uh, it really is quite a special place. Uh, and I suppose for us, one of the real distinctions of Hong Kong is the fact that um, it's really the meeting of two worlds. Uh, so you have the Chinese world uh, going back with its history and culture for thousands of years and also the um, sort of colonial history, uh, particularly with the British, uh, in which they've inherited a sort of way of organising and uh, running themselves in a sort of Western style way. Um, this is uh, particularly relevant uh, with regard to the growth of China and in some ways Hong Kong is seen as the uh, sort of gateway for the West uh, into China. And um, But there are other things uh, for Hong Kong as well, it's, uh, it's regarded as a food capital and uh, also is a great art destination. So let's have a look at um, why that's happened. Um, historically, uh, Hong Kong um, used to do a lot of um, sort of trade in sort of um, traditional um, Chinese art. Um, but over the last 30 years, but more particularly in the last 10 years, there's been acceleration with regard to contemporary art, and uh, and this has been fueled by the huge investment that the government's made in sort of art infrastructure with the building of sort of art precincts and art galleries. Um, also aligned with that has been a lot of sort of other institution and non for profits. Um, great growth in sort of Chinese galleries, uh, and there was a huge influx in the last ten years of uh, major uh, international um, uh, galleries. Um, and also the uh, advent of uh, international art fairs. Uh, you can have a look at the statistic here it's that uh, from 1991 to 2018, uh, the sales of fine arts swelled from approximately 11 million to 1.4 billion. So you can see that art has become really big business. Another, another factor which uh, a lot of people are not aware of is one of the advantages of Hong Kong is the fact that it's a uh, free port. Uh, so there's no taxation of art going in and out of the country, uh, in addition to the fact that Hong Kong is a uh, low taxation um, um, place. Um, there's a lot of expats in Hong Kong, and uh, one, one of the beauties of Hong Kong is that it's a very cosmopolitan city. So let's move on to where we stayed. Um, Lee and I, when we travel, we used to, we usually try to stay in sort of really um, offbeat type of places, uh, boutique hotels or designer hotels. Uh, uh, usually we like to stay in apartments and, um, and we'll have even stayed in Airbnbs and uh, bed and breakfasts. And, um, and we found this place uh, which really appealed to us. It's a sort of very architectural minimalist aesthetic and it's in a part of, uh, the city which is uh, just a little bit out of Causeway Bay. It's in Tin, Tin Hao. Um, so it's a little bit off the beaten track for tourists and it's a great location for local cuisine. Um, so this is the outside and you can see it's sort of really stark contrast to um, all the colour and glitter for the rest of Hong Kong. 
And uh, when you go into the public spaces, you can see that it's sort of, sort of quite dark and somber and really quite uh, mysterious. Um, and they use a lot of natural materials like um, uh, metal and concrete and uh, stone. And um, but when you go into the rooms, you can see that the rooms are really in line with that minimalist aesthetic, but uh, really bright and light. And, um, and the rooms are quite large for Hong Kong, so it was really comfortable. But for us, I think the great advantage of this hotel was the fact that it was sort of like a real contrast to um, the sort of sensory overload that you get in Hong Kong with regard to the sound and the noise and the color and the lights and the 24 seven sort of energy there. And it was just a great retreat uh, to, to go there and just sort of chill out. And, um, and from that point of view, uh, I think the architects said that they wanted to actually create a sense of luxury through the minimalism, which I think they've achieved really quite well. But I think really what's interesting about this, and you might wonder why it's called the Tuve Hotel, is that the owners or the developers of the hotel actually gave the architects these photographs by a, a Danish art, uh, photographer called Kim Holterman of photographs that he took of Lake Tuve in Sweden. And because um, they wanted to sort of capture this sort of um, tranquility, uh, which I think they've done quite successfully. Anyway, we arrived in Hong Kong at um, 7.30 and I think we got into the hotel about nine o'clock. So we just dumped our bags and um, sort of hopped onto the uh, subway and headed off to the Peta building, which is in central uh, Hong Kong. And um, I've been to the Peta building before and uh, what's attractive about the Peta building is that it's sort of a vertical sort of street of uh, galleries. And uh, it's one of the first buildings in um, Hong Kong that actually started attracting uh, these uh, international um, uh, galleries. And, um, and what's interesting about the Peta building is that actually it's a sort of uh, built in 1932. It's a sort of Beaux-Arts style and it's sort of, one of the rare examples of a uh, historic building that's actually been preserved in Hong Kong. Um, so uh, it's in a great location. And um, so there's a whole heap of galleries, which I'll just uh, quickly uh, take you through. So um, we have Ben Brown. Ben Brown is actually was born in Hong Kong, but uh, he's English and he's actually uh, set up in London, his first uh, gallery, but uh, he set up a gallery, his uh, Hong Kong gallery, in uh, 2009 and um, and basically he um, he shows um, in international artists like this one Yoan Capote who's in fact a Cuban art artist who um, lives and uh, works in Havana and um, and you can see one of the things you'll see from this talk is the huge diversity of art um, works in both technique and concept uh, in all respects and these are actually being composed of fish hooks, uh, which is, I suppose, something very Cuban with regard to fishing. Um, so he's a sculptor who works in multimedia. And, uh, um, but Ben Brown is no longer at the Peta building. He's subsequently moved out because uh, being in central um, Hong Kong is very expensive. And, um, and he's done equivalent to someone being in a city moving out to sort of Collingwood or um, Fitzroy. Um, another gallery is Lawrence Van Hagen. Uh, he's a, um, an art advisor and uh, curator who actually uh, works out of London, um, although he's got a very multicultural background. He's actually very young. He's only in his 20s and um, I think he comes from self central casting if you have a look at his uh, photos on uh, on the on the web um, and he's put together this exhibition of some really uh, sort of uh, heavy hitters in, in the art world they sort of got Anthony Gormley, Brancusi uh, in this particular exhibition um, as well as Bridget Riley and um, who else has he got there? Uh, Lee Ufan and Zhang Fanzi amongst others and um, so it was a sort of um, a very uh, mixed uh, gallery and it was actually put on specially to coincide with the um, um, Art Basel uh, Hong Kong Art Fair, uh, which also coincides with Hong Kong Art Week. And below we have Hanart TZ Gallery, which is a um, Chinese gallery and uh, they've been around for quite a long time. I think they opened up in um, 
uh, let me see, when did they open up? In 1983. Um, and they represent uh, Chinese artists. Um, and these are artists who are either from mainland China or from Taiwan or Hong Kong or even from the diaspora. Um, and this, this particular artist is uh, Yen Shi Cheng. And um, he um, was... Um, originally from mainland China, but he actually fled uh, during the uh, Communist Revolution to Taiwan. He started his life as a calligrapher and ink painter. And you can see his work now is really a sort of mix between uh, sort of traditional Chinese artwork and modernist Western work. Um, so uh, we go to now Pearl Lam Gallery, that is also a Chinese gallery, and uh, they've got um, Two, uh, two galleries in Hong Kong, uh, as well as Shanghai. Um, she founded her gallery in 2005. She comes from sort of very wealthy uh, family and, um, and she, uh, main focus actually promoting contemporary Chinese art. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, she had on show um, the artist Leonardo Drew, who's actually a US artist uh, who lives and works in Brooklyn. Um, he actually grew up in the projects. Um, these are sort of like housing commission and, and particularly where he grew up was next to a city dump. So he uses a lot of found objects in his art. And, um, and you can see it's quite, quite beautiful, the work that, uh, so from this flotsam and jetsam, he actually created some really exquisite work. And um, it also shows, I think, the uh, sort of cross-cultural uh, activities of these galleries where they are representing both um, so international Western artists, as well as uh, local Chinese artists as well. And now, where are we going? So after we finished with the Petter building, we, um, we sort of grabbed some lunch and we went back to a hotel to have an afternoon nap to try and catch up because that evening, um, we were invited to give a talk uh, to a group, uh, Friends of the Art Museum for the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, this group actually came to JAM um, in 2018 and um, as part of a group. Um, and um, so they invited us if we ever came to Hong Kong to give a talk because they're quite interested in the whole idea of a sort of private house museum, uh, which we did uh, once we uh, found out we we're going to Art Basel. So we li liaised with them uh, to give a talk. Um, they couldn't uh, actually hold it at the university because uh, all their facilities were booked out. So they organized to, um, for the talk to take place at the Min Chu Society, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but you can see from the audience that it's both uh, Western and Chinese and uh, sort of very cosmopolitan and eclectic. And, um, and it was a beautiful night. Uh, they gave us a gorgeous dinner afterwards and uh, we sort of we met some in interesting people. Uh, but what I found particularly interesting was the um, the Minchu Society, and uh, I, I did some reading on that and uh, found out that it's a very private, exclusive um, club uh, for um, collectors of uh, traditional Chinese art. And um, in fact, our, our host, who I believe also belongs to the uh, Minchu Society, um, was telling us how he sort of missed out on a uh, work for his collection, which was a bowl not dissimilar to what you see in the showcase there. Uh, which he missed out for the cool sum of 250,000 US dollars. Um, so they hold exhibitions uh, of their collectors. And, uh, and I think a year ago, or a couple of years ago, they had a major exhibition at one of the museums uh, from their collection, uh, for which they produced a catalog. Okay, so um, now we move on to H Queens, uh, which is the building on the right hand side here. And this is just around the corner from the Petter building. And this was uh, developed by, a, um, by some developers who um, decided to um, change their original concept of a commercial office building into what they call a culture and lifestyle style building. And their intent was actually to fill it with uh, galleries and uh, design stores and restaurants and uh, um, other food and beverage places. And, uh, and consequently, they attracted some real major international museums, which I'll go through now. 
Uh, Whitestone is in fact a Tokyo gallery and uh, they um, specialize in uh, promoting Japanese contemporary art around the world. And they've got galleries in, um, in uh, Tokyo and uh, I think also in uh, Seoul. And, and, um, and they use an architect called Kengo Kuma, who's uh, one of my favorite architects who does the fit outs to their um, uh, galleries. And uh, he, he did this uh, interesting entry lobby uh, in the gallery at uh, H Queens. Um, and uh, on the left here, you can see a work by Yayo Kusama, who's a major uh, Japanese uh, contemporary artist. Um, then we, um, on another floor, we have uh, Spruth uh, Magers, who are uh, two, um, two women gallerists uh, from Cologne, and uh, they've um, got galleries there. They started in the 80s, and they've got galleries in London, Berlin, LA, and Cologne, um, as well as Hong Kong and Seoul. Um, and, uh, and Monica Spruth, actually, um, when she started, she had a particular focus on uh, women artists, and she also produced a magazine called Oda Cologne, uh, which obviously a play on words uh, on the city of Cologne. And, um, and she had a major uh, exhibition of uh, um, sort of the leading world uh, women artists. And uh, so they had a reprise of this exhibition uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, you can see Leah standing there in front of uh, a Rosemary Trocal uh, uh, abstract works. And um, Your Body is a Battleground is a, is a work by uh, Barbara Kruger. And uh, the work on the right with the text and the neon is by Jenny Holzer. And um, bottom left is a work by Cindy Sherman. And, and these are sort of really museum collected uh, major female artists from around the world. So one of the, one of the things you find for going to some of these international galleries is you get museum quality exhibitions. On another floor, Hows and Worth, I actually had two floors. Uh, they are a Swiss uh, based um, uh, gallery and um, they are founded in Zurich and they've got galleries in London and New York and LA and uh, some other cities. And, um, and they have a, a stable of major artists. And in this particular uh, exhibition, they sh were showing work by Louise Bourgeois, who's a major uh, artist who uh, was born in France and lives, lived in the US and worked in the US and she died about 10 years ago. But she is uh, really a major artist. And uh, below we have Pace Gallery, which is a US gallery. Now you would have noticed that um, these major galleries come from all different cities around the world uh, showing um, uh, their origin and, uh, and the sort of globalization of uh, the um, art world in terms of both the artists and also the collectors. Um, so Pace is showing the work uh, by, a, um, by an artist called Mary uh, course, um, who sort of started in the 60s and um, she's been described as being a mix of an abstract expressionist and a minimalist and uh, in many ways she's got a very sort of um, uh, sort of Asian aesthetic uh, with regard to the minimalist uh, quality of work and uh, when you compare it to some of the other Asian art that we see you can see there's, there's some strong similarities there. And, uh, and then we come to Tang Contemporary. Uh, that's also a Chinese gallery. And, um, and, and what's interesting here is that they are representing uh, both a Western artist and also a Chinese artist. So Adele uh, Adbasemed is an Algerian uh, artist, uh, or Algerian born. And I think he now uh, works in France. And, and uh, his work is on the left there, and uh, he's got a particular focus on violence, um, judging, uh, you can understand from the background that he comes from. Um, so the paintings you see there are actually painted with blood, uh, which is sort of a little bit disconcerting, and uh, the sculpture you see there is a crushed aeroplane. And on the right you have a, the works by uh, Zhu Yang Ming, um, who was uh, actually born, uh, works and lives in, chi uh, in China. He, um, 
He was originally based in Beijing, but now he's sort of living out in the countryside. Uh, he just wanted to get away from the big city, which, which is understandable with regard if you, uh, to his aesthetic that uh, you can see there. It's a really beautiful work and, um, and I, the photos don't really do them justice. But what, what's interesting is that uh, here you have a Chinese gallery sort of representing, uh, as some of the other galleries, uh, representing both Western and Chinese artists, which in many ways reinforces this idea of Hong Kong being the meeting place of the East and West. Okay, so um, after we finished with H Queens, we sort of uh, walked up the hill uh, to the Taekwon Centre for Heritage and Art. Um, this is a um, recent development and uh, it is a major commitment by the uh, Hong Kong government um, to create a, um, an, an arts precinct. Um, uh, this used to be the Central Police Station, uh, which actually stopped operating at the uh, end of the 1990s. And um, so it was a designated a sort of heritage site, uh, one of the top rated heritage sites in uh, Hong Kong. Um, so basically they undertook themselves to, um, to restore, uh, conserve and repurpose the buildings. And as you can see from the diagram on the left, uh, there was a sort of, it's quite a large site of several hectares and uh, with, uh, I think about 15 buildings on it, uh, existing buildings, which um, house the uh, police stations, their headquarters, barracks, jails, uh, also magistrates courts. Uh, so it was a whole sort of complex. And um, uh, so in addition to the restoration, they also uh, inserted two new buildings uh, by uh, international star architects Herzog and de Miron. Uh, Herzog and de Miron uh, designed uh, Tate Modern as well as some other major uh, art museums around the world. They designing another one in Hong Kong, the M Plus, which we'll talk about later, uh, Contemporary Art uh, Museum. Um, and they also did another large job in China. They, uh, together with the artist Ai Weiwei, they designed the Birdcage, which was the principal stadium in Beijing for the Olympic Games. Um, so um, the Taekwon Center is a sort of uh, uh, publicly based um, uh, arts precinct and um, it contains a series of um, um, galleries, meeting places, uh, studios, and um, a whole heap of um, uh, facilities uh, to cater for uh, public programs, performances, and education. Um, and you can see here that uh, not only are the buildings, but they also got some, uh, some wonderful open spaces and um, uh, and a few years ago, Paul, my son Paul and I were there and we were there one evening and they had sort of uh, uh, projections onto the buildings, um, similar to what you see here on um, during the, the White Nights. And now one of the challenges of this project was to sort of bring it up to uh, modern, modern standards and uh, also to make it transparent, uh, sort of permeable, uh, because before it was actually designed to keep people out and it had to be redesigned to let people through. And you can see here the, um, the auditorium, which is the undercroft to the um, uh, theatre, which is used for public performances. And on the left, you can see uh, these are the jail cells, which have been refurbished, uh, which are used for display purposes. And on the right, uh, one of the spaces being converted into a uh, local museum, uh, looking at the history of not only the uh, Tai Kwan area, but also Hong Kong in general. And now we come to the Contemporary Art Museum, which is the um, building by Herzog and the Muron. And, um, and that, that is a distinctly contemporary building, as you can see, uh, with its uh, interesting facade of um, cast aluminium bricks, so to speak. And, um, and its uh, purpose really is to promote uh, Chinese art or Hong Kong art and to uh, create the centre. And one of the interesting things about this project is that it sort of indicates the sort of big commitment. I think it was sort of like 700 million Australian dollars this project cost. Um, 
Uh, and, that, and this is on top of the uh, M plus or the uh, West Kowloon, which is another huge investment. Uh, and and uh, Hong Kong aren't the only people doing this. It's happening all over the world. Uh, the only place it's not happening is in fact in Australia. I think Australia regards art as sort of equivalent to roads. And uh, in fact, they got rid of the arts ministry. Um, but these other places are much more sophisticated. They recognize that art is in fact an economic driver and, um, uh, and it's a sort of major boost to the local economy and also to innovation for other industries as well. So this is interior view. Um, so the focus here is not to, um, to promote edgy art, uh, not the art that you sort of see in commercial galleries. And um, so what it does do is provides just a sort of another take on art, uh, which is a contrast to what you see in the more traditional spaces. Uh, the Hong Kong Arts Centre is a non-for-profit and um, it was actually uh, one of the early uh, institutions in Hong Kong. Uh, I think they celebrated their uh, 40th anniversary uh, this year. And uh, it includes a whole series of uh, galleries and studios. And um, it also um, has a recital hall and a theater and um, studio and office space and uh, some restaurants as well. And um, this was actually put together privately, uh, although the Hong Kong government provided the land, um, the money raised for this facility was uh, all privately raised and, um, and uh, its running costs are also privately funded, which is interesting. Um, so um, while we were there, they had a interesting exhibition. It's uh, the fifth collector's contemporary collaboration. Every year they have an exhibition of um, Chinese collectors. So there were three Chinese collectors from uh, different parts of China, uh, which also showed the diversity of the art that was collected from more traditional Chinese art to uh, quite edgy uh, art. And, um, and it was just interesting. Uh, this is not the sort of art that you'd necessarily see anywhere else. And uh, so it's great to have an institution like that where you can actually pick that art up. So this is the main reason we came, which was the Art Basel Hong Kong Art Fair. And it was held in this building, which is sitting in the middle of the water, which is the Hong Kong Exhibition Center, um, yeah, which is in uh, central Hong Kong. And um, it's, it's a large facility. I don't know if you know much about art fairs, but art fairs have become big business. And Art Basel is the sort of biggest and most powerful uh, art fair operator. Uh, they started in uh, in Basel and um, and they actually bought out two other art fairs or I think the not maybe one they might have started um, so um, so they have three principal venues uh, Hong Kong which takes care of the Asian territory Basel which takes care of the European territory and uh, Miami which takes care of the Americas and um, and it's a big deal. Uh, it's, a, it's a very big fair and there's a lot happening, not only the fair itself, but a lot of the accompanying activities to go with it. Um, their principal sponsor is UBS, um, which is a, a Swiss bank. And each year they develop a, um, and they do a report. Um, well, let me see, excuse me a second. Yeah, the Global Art Market Report, which, uh, attempts to um, uh, understand the sort of economic activity of the art market worldwide, um, which is a challenge in itself because uh, the art market is very opaque. Um, but um, what, what, what they've indicated is that the, um, that the uh, market is huge and they are also saying that art fairs um, account for 40% of the business worldwide uh, of art sold, uh, which some people dispute, uh, could be self-serving. Um, but it does indicate that uh, art fairs is where a lot of galleries go because you know, the art world is now globalized and it's an ideal place for artists, collectors and galleries to meet and, and uh, to uh, showcase work from all different regions. Um, so uh, Hong Kong is quite a big deal. Uh, in 2019, they attracted 88,000 visitors. Um, but not only uh, collectors, they also attract um, 
So directors, curators, trustees, and patrons from all the major museums from and around the world. Um, and, um, and, and that's one of the benefits of having an art fair like that. It's also a meeting place where people get together and uh, sort of compare notes and make connections and do a lot of networking. Um, it's over two floors and uh, let me tell you, it is exhausting. Uh, uh, there's 242 galleries uh, from 35 countries. And um, just to give you an idea, to get from the front door to the gallery space takes about a 20 minute walk. And, uh, and in, in, in the uh, outside areas, a whole heap of stalls with regard to uh, uh, media and magazines and, um, um, and um, sort of uh, lecture theatres and um, places where you can talk and eat and um, so it's full time. I, I think you cannot see it in one day. It uh, definitely takes two or three days to do it justice. Um, what Lee and I tend to do is we tend to skate around uh, and then go back and sort of look at it in a little bit more detail. So as most art fairs, they have uh, sort of uh, installations which uh, are sort of installed by some of the galleries in, in conjunction with uh, Art Basel. It's also where you meet. Uh, so we bumped into some friends and uh, met some of their associates uh, there. Um, but you see a huge amount of art. Uh, I, I won't even make a dent in the sort of, not only the extent of the art that's there, but also its diversity and variety. And there's so much stuff there to cater for every taste. So what you'll be seeing is the stuff that we particularly like. So uh, you, you get a huge range as well, uh, because uh, Art Basel deals with some real big ticket items. So on the left, uh, you have a work by Anish Kapoor, who's an Indian-born English artist. And uh, on, the, on the right, uh, we have a work by uh, Ugo Rondinoni. And, uh, and these works uh, sort of be selling for in, in, in the millions. And, uh, but uh, at, at the other end, you get smaller galleries. And I think Australia is quite well represented. One of our favourites was this um, gallery by Fox Jensen, who is a New Zealand gallery. And, um, and they showcase not only New Zealand artists, but also Australian artists. And uh, they've got some Scottish artists like this one here and some German artists as well. Um, and then you get uh, representation by, uh, for some of the public installation uh, work by uh, Tony Albert, who's a highly regarded uh, Indigenous artist and um, who had a major retrospective in uh, Queensland last year, uh, Queensland Gallery, and um, he's, rep he's represented by um, Sydney Gallery, Sullivan and Strumpf. So, um, so then we come to Art Central. Uh, Art Central is a satellite fair, and um, and you can see uh, in, in the distance uh, here the uh, Art Basel. So it's uh, it's a few kilometres away, and they've actually uh, working in conjunction because there's the, they've arranged a shuttle bus to take you from one to the other. And, and what the satellite fairs do is that they sort of provide an opportunity for. Um, so second tier um, galleries, uh, not always second tier. Uh, some people prefer to be in central. And um, so, uh, but uh, generally the art is at a sort of lower price point and uh, it also offers again, uh, more diversity with regard to the art that you can see. Um, it's actually located in tent. These tents are permanent, uh, so they actually cater to other events and exhibitions uh, throughout the year. And you can see that um, um, it's um, sort of the setup is not dissimilar to what you see in Art Basel, uh, albeit it's in a tent. And um, and you see some uh, interesting works. So these works are what uh, the equivalent to the public uh, works. Uh, so of a much more modest scale than uh, what Art Basel would uh, tend to put on. And, um, but you see some really interesting works. This is a work that actually caught my fancy. It's a, a portrait of, made, uh, of Mao, and, uh, but it's actually made up of uh, a series of pixelations of uh, painted toy soldiers. Um, now, this is a political uh, statement. Uh, I don't know if that would actually pass muster with the new uh, laws that they've introduced, but it'll be interesting to see what unfolds. Um, but then you also see some traditional works um, of contemporary uh, Asian art from um, 
Japan, Korea, and China. And, um, and this is an aesthetic which I, I really like and um, it's a big attraction for us. Um, and, but you also see work by Australian artists. So this is a work by Stephen Haley, who's an artist that we collect. And in fact, we bought one of these works while we were in Hong Kong uh, to add to our collection. And this is represented by Mars Gallery uh, here in Paran. So another thing that happens uh, during this period, uh, during uh, Hong Kong Art Week and Art Basel is that there's a series of conferences and uh, this conference was actually put on by Larry's List. Uh, Larry's List is an organization that's sort of uh, based in Hong Kong and, um, and what it does, it services collectors. So they have a sort of database of collectors and they service collectors by providing them with information and uh, networking opportunities and uh, visit, visiting rights and running conferences like this. Um, uh, now, Larry's uh, list is, I, I believe, a play, a play on the name of uh, Larry Gagosian, who is um, reputed to be the biggest commercial uh, uh, contemporary art gallerist in the world. And uh, so Larry's list, you can imagine it's Larry Gosian's list, so it must be pretty uh, high powered. And um, so, um, uh, but I don't think they admit to that. <laughs> um, this uh, conference was held at the uh, Peninsula Hotel, which is one of the grand hotels that every city has, like the uh, Raffles in Singapore or the Ritz Carlton in, um, in New York. Um, and um, and uh, it was uh, open to private museum operators. So this particular conference was um, um, pitched to uh, inviting young um, social entrepreneurs. So all the people here that you see speaking uh, uh, come from uh, families which have um, high wealth and uh, essentially what they're doing, they're uh, using their parents' money to um, develop uh, art institution, non-for-profits, uh, which they see adding value back into the communities that they come from. Uh, so it's very interesting to uh, listen to how they're doing, um, uh, doing this and, um, uh, and, and also the diversity, the different ways that they're actually using art to uh, achieve these ends. Um, at the same time, you meet other collectors. So um, uh, on the picture on the top right, you have Christopher No, who actually runs um, um, Larry's list, and um, and next to him, uh, this couple is um, Don and uh, hang on a yeah. Don, Don and Mira Rubel, who are mega collectors from the US, and uh, they're ex New York, and they're now uh, living in Miami, and um, they have actually set up two huge. Uh, private art museums, which are definitely on my bucket list uh, when, uh, to go and see because uh, they have some uh, fantastic artists. And the gentleman on the left uh, is um, Scott Stover. And he's also got an interesting background. He's a former investment banker and he now runs a philanthropy advisory service uh, specialising in art and culture. So one of the other things that is uh, great about uh, going to an art fair uh, or going to a place on Hong Kong during the art fair is the sort of interesting people that you bump into and uh, get to meet. Uh, so um, then we had a wander through the Peninsula Hotel to see some of the art installations that they put on specifically for um, Hong Kong Art Week and uh, Art Basel and, um, and by various artists. And it's, sort of, it's a real commitment. Uh, and this room was a fantastic room <coughs> that had been built. Um, it's immersive, you actually uh, sit in the room and uh, I think it's been set up for selfies and you can see with the fisheye mirror and um, which we uh, took advantage of um, again uh, to see something different and uh, alternative to what you're used to. Okay, this is another example of how art is being used um, um, in, in the new world of development. So K11 is a major uh, commercial development. It's um, it's on the Kowloon uh, Harbour side, uh, opposite the island, and um, it's um, composed of a, a tower, uh, office tower. Uh, there's uh, service apartments, a huge shopping centre, 
there's a hotel um, and um, there are some uh, studios as well, I believe. And, um, and uh, the cost of this was 2.6 billion US. So it's a humongous development. Uh, but what's really interesting is that the CEO of the development country uh, company is actually a young uh, Chinese entrepreneur, um, Adrian Cheng, and um, he studied art at Harvard. He got a degree at Harvard and he's got some postgraduate uh, degrees uh, in other uh, US uh, universities. So he essentially comes from an art background. And uh, so his idea was to imbue this whole development uh, with an art focus. And um, so, um, so he's got art right throughout. I think um, they appointed uh, about over a hundred uh, architects, uh, artists, uh, designers, and artisans to uh, fit this place out. Um, so on the right, you can see the shopping, and even some of the shops were art oriented, where they sold uh, art and designer uh, oriented goods. Um, there's also a space uh, called Hack Space, where um, sort of experimental artists are invited to come and do some work. Um, but the, another major commitment that uh, Adrian Chang has put in is uh, to set up the K11 Art Foundation. So on the 21st floor of the um, of the office tower uh, is a floor which is a exhibition space and the of, uh, and the offices of the foundation. And in this particular case, they had a exhibition called Glow Like That, which explored how light actually interacts with different surfaces uh, on artworks. And um, so it, was a, it wasn't it was sort of a really deep and thoughtful theme, but um, it was just interesting to see the commitment uh, that uh, someone had uh, in a sort of totally privately funded foundation, which uh, looks to um, promote art in all its different guises. So um, that, that was uh, really interesting. So we come to another part of Kowloon. This is uh, West Kowloon, and um, this is uh, the West Kowloon, uh, I think, uh, cultural district. And it's a very um, ambitious scheme. You can see here, it's also built on the, um, on, on, on the foreshore there, and it includes a whole series of theatres and cultural centres and music centres and lyric theatres and a the M Plus uh, Museum, uh, which is a uh, which you can see on the top left um, hand corner, uh, which is designed by Herzog and Muren. And this is actually not only a contemporary art museum, but also they collect design and also architecture. So it's a broad based, and you can see it under construction below. And there's a huge park there, as well as some other museum and exhibition spaces. And there's also the M Plus Pavilion, which is what I'm going to talk about next. Um, this is the first uh, building that was uh, built um, in the West Kowloon Precinct. It's, um, it's, actually, <laughs> it's actually quite hidden. It's in the middle of nowhere. We actually had to drive around the circles trying to find it. It's actually quite hidden uh, with the mirrored walls and uh, sort of buried into the burn there. And it's actually a um, combination um, exhibition space and um, event space. And uh, you can see this sort of uh, very um, sort of a ceremonial entry that you have there and a platform which you can stand and look over the site uh, to watch the development. And But it just happened they had a terrific exhibition when we were there. And uh, this is a um, uh, exhibition that was called um, Noguchi for Dan Vo counterpoint. So essentially what they did is they counterpointed the works of two artists. So there was um, Isamu Noguchi, who is a very celebrated uh, US-born uh, artist of um, Japanese descent. And um, he actually he died in 1988 and he, he was a sculptor and designer. Um, so this lamp and this sculpture here and this work here are by um, Noguchi. And Dan Vo is a Danish artist who was actually born in Vietnam and uh, who's cu currently pra uh, practicing and uh, 
he's actually been he's being collected by major museums from around the world and uh, it was just interesting to see the work of not only artists of different generations but both uh, western based artists of asian origin and uh, so um, yeah it was, it was terrific so we really enjoyed that okay so the following day we actually went uh, back to town and uh, we went to Gallery Perotin, which is another major gallery, which actually started in Paris. And um, um, so he started his first gallery in 1990 at the age of 21. He now has galleries in Paris, Hong Kong, New York, Seoul, Tokyo, and Shanghai. And, and uh, on display, uh, we'll, we'll see two artists. So this artist is um, Xu Zhen, who's a Chinese artist. And uh, what, he, what he's interested in is the fusion of Western and uh, Chinese culture. Uh, and this sculpture is a, a classic example. It's sort of a uh, classic uh, antiquity uh, uh, sculpture, sort of smashed into a sort of Buddhist sculpture. Um, this work, uh, uh, an example of this work is actually in part of Judith Nielsen from White Rabbit's collection, which was on display at the NGV last year. Um, but uh, what the main part of this exhibition was this work here, um, which is also quite subversive. And um, so what from a distance look like, like a minimalist work, when you look up close, as you do on the left, you see this sort of uh, really over the, over the top ostentatious glitz. And, um, uh, and it's actually paint that's actually been applied using a cake piping, piping uh, squeegee. And, uh, <laughs> and I think that it sort of really highlights uh, both the uh, preoccupation in the West and in China with regard to uh, wealth and ostentatious um, uh, lifestyles. So you get this sort of, sort of contradiction with the sort of uh, distant view of the minimalist and the up close view of the uh, uh, over the top ostentatious. Um, so uh, that was an interesting exhibition. But the other exhibition was also fantastic. Uh, and this is uh, Julio Le Parc, who's an Argent Argentinian artist, um, but he actually left Argentina uh, quite a while back and because um, uh, he was born in 1928. And um, so he was really concerned about the uh, sort of uh, the junta in, um, in Argentina. And, um, and I think that uh, the theme of this work is uh, disorientation and, um, so you can see the, um, the work that's been applied to the floors, walls and ceiling and together with the curved mirrors to um, uh, give you a really disconcerting uh, environment, but it's uh, amazingly Instagram, Instagrammable. And, um, and it's just fantastic. But one of the things it does highlight is the, um, the commitment that these galleries uh, go to display their artists' work. And, um, and that's why we enjoy going to them because you get sort of uh, museum quality shows um, in these galleries, which uh, sort of um, um, some last uh, a few months, but um, it's a real commitment on their part. In the same building is uh, another international uh, gallery, uh, White Cube, which has actually started in London and uh, they've got uh, two galleries in London and one in Hong Kong. And they're showing a Canadian artist called David uh, Altmedge, and um, it's called The Vibrating Man. And uh, I think what he's looking at there is um, exploring the, um, the sort of duality of what it is to be a um, human being or the human character. And uh, sort of um, talking about fake versus real, organic versus mineral, and seductive versus repulsive. Uh, so they're <laughs> <laughs> really quite disconcerting works. Okay, now we come to uh, one of um, uh, our favourite uh, destinations in Hong Kong. This is the Asia Society, which is located in Admir Admiralty, which is sort of a little bit out of the centre, uh, up the hill a bit, and uh, it's on a large site, which is uh, set uh, pretty much in a tropical forest. Um, the Asia Society is actually an organisation that was founded by John D. Rockefeller and uh, its intent was really to uh, try to promote mutual understanding and strengthen the partnerships between um, the East and the West, uh, particularly the US. Uh, and, and they have um, uh, sort of 
institutions all over the world, and uh, I think even including in Australia. Uh, but in Hong Kong, uh, this facility was actually uh, built in 2012, uh, and it's on the site of what was the explosive magazines of the old Victoria Barracks. Um, they appointed um, Todd Williams and Billy Sen, who are sort of highly regarded uh, US architects who are um, they're very um, experienced in uh, uh, cultural buildings. Uh, they designed the American uh, muse the Museum of American Folklore, um, which uh, tragically was demolished uh, because it was built next to the Museum of Modern Art and they needed to expand, so they bought it and uh, pulled it down. Uh, a lot of controversy. Um, but um, yeah, they do beautiful work, as you'll see in this building. And um, and because the building is sort of so multi-layered, being on the hilly site, it's uh, it was a real experience. So what they did is they built all these uh, new uh, interventions, uh, which includes sort of uh, uh, restaurants and assembly buildings and uh, other facilities, and uh, which we'll see as we go through this. So you can see some of these um, uh, heritage buildings which were restored and uh, on the left you can see the new, I think this the cafe, uh, the restaurant uh, behind there. Um, and you can see this sort of mixing of the old, old and new. And uh, they also had two fantastic exhibitions on. So they had one by Han Chi Fun uh, called The Story of Light. Um, uh, he, he's a um, Chinese artist who, um, was um, uh, actually a Hong Kong artist and uh, who's actually it was actually self-taught and um, and his day job was as a postal inspector uh, so he uh, was born in 22 so he goes back a long way and um, he um, was fascinated with light and uh, from what the story goes he actually uh, introduced airbrush to uh, Hong Kong and uh, produced these beautiful um, ephemeral light-based works. Um, but he also um, went through the pop era. So uh, what's great about a retrospective like this, you can see the uh, artists over over the lifespan of their career. Um, and then moving on, uh, one of the joys of um, the Asia Society is actually walking through it. Uh, you sort of walk, walking through the treetops on these elevated walkways, uh, which uh, is just fantastic. And you get great vistas over the um, uh, over the city, and uh, but also over the uh, landscape there. And um, and uh, as we go from one end to the other, we came to another exhibition space where they had a James Turrell. Um, um, light work on and um, on the right you can see uh, two examples of the light work so these uh, James Turrell is probably one of the world's greatest light, light artists and um, he's got installations here at Mona he's got extensive I think there are three or four installations at Mona he's got one at the National Gallery in Canberra and uh, nearly every major museum has got a James Turrell somewhere tucked away and um, if you've got a Picasso you need to have a James Turrell uh, but his works are really immersive and uh, really beautiful works. And, um, and then we come to the Upper Terrace, uh, which is a, a great entertaining space. Uh, some beautiful artworks there, as you can see, uh, interspersed amongst the landscape. Uh, we were fortunate enough uh, early in our trip to Hong Kong to be invited one evening to the uh, Gallery of New South Wales uh, cocktail party. So uh, this sort of view on the left you see, uh, plus a lot of people uh, uh, on a lovely balmy night was uh, really quite an experience. So the last um, um, gallery that we went to was uh, Parasite, which is uh, actually a, um, a non-for-profit uh, uh, independent art institution, uh, which was founded in 1996, uh, originally as an artist run space. And um, so um, they are sort of a little bit um, uh, on the outskirts, probably equivalent to being in sort of um, Brunswick, and Brunswick equivalent of uh, Hong Kong. And, uh, and they had this uh, exhibition that was really quite interesting called An Opera for Animals. And um, essentially what they were doing is they sort of uh, leveraging off the idea that the golden age of opera in Europe was during the colonial era. era. 
and that uh, the Westerners always looked down on Eastern culture, which actually had quite a strong animist uh, foundation. And, um, and basically what the uh, exhibition was saying uh, through the artwork that uh, not much has changed. There's, there's still this air of superiority about Western culture to Eastern culture. And uh, these artworks were uh, to explore that. Um, so um, it was an amazing actually exhibition for uh, the type of organisation it is with many international artists and uh, including Australian artist uh, Juan de Villa. And um, uh, although I must say that uh, we, we struggled to understand the, um, <laughs> how some of these artworks fit, fitted into the theme, but um, uh, there was some interesting artwork nonetheless. Anyway, one of the things about the trip that we had to into Hong Kong in 2019 is that a lot ha has happened in Hong Kong uh, since then. And um, in many ways of all the places that we visited, Hong Kong is the um, one that has changed the most. Um, so firstly, uh, they had the Fugitive Amendment Bill, which was a bill to actually extradite uh, people who had been accused uh, of criminal acts to be uh, tried in a Chinese court on the mainland, uh, which uh, everyone protested again about because the legal system in China is quite different to that in Hong Kong. And, uh, and people were afraid that their autonomy and civil liberties were being eroded. Um, the protests then they turned violent and, um, and then emergency powers were declared and then COVID hit. And, um, and during COVID period, China introduced the national security law covering secession, foreign interference, terrorism and subversion, which is so broad based that virtually uh, any, anyone could easily be picked up and arrested uh, for doing something that was deemed to be against the state. Uh, there are a lot of arrests and intimidation. And, um, and the reason I raise this is because uh, when it comes to art, uh, one of the characteristics of art is art is actually very sort of challenging. Uh, you know, artists are actually um, sort of questioning the status quo and um, uh, a lot of art is quite politically motivated. And, um, and many people in the art world are really worried because they can see themselves as being sort of uh, under this law, being very vulnerable. Um, so there's a lot of debate as to what's going to happen to the Hong Kong art scene as a result of this. And um, so um, uh, at the moment, there's two theories. So some are very pessimistic and thinking that a lot of people are going to move out and to um, Singapore and others sort of saying no. Uh, look what's happened in Shanghai and Beijing. Things are still uh, operating, uh, albeit at a different level. And uh, the draw of being close or connected to the Chinese economy is too great. So only time will tell. Um, but all I can say is I don't think that uh, the Hong Kong we saw in 2019 will ever see again. So thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to an end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the share and um, we're going to now go back to saying our goodbyes. So I think Leah's going to join us and um, great to see you all. And the, the, I know the question you want to ask is, uh, were we absolutely exhausted? Yes, it was five <laughs> whirlwind days. It was absolutely an extraordinary uh, experience and we had the most fantastic time. We're really thrilled that you could join us. Uh, we really look forward to joining us again for some of the other talks that we're having. Um, we wanted to wish our, our family and our friends and um, Shana Tova a happy uh, Jewish New Year, which starts next week. And, and to all of you, uh, we hope that you continue to stay safe and well in these extraordinary times. And we're really thrilled that we could take you out of the, 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 the normal daily um, churn right. and journey with us uh, to Hong Kong without any jet lag and without any of that, that sort of hassle. Okay, now we need to fill it, finish on an advertisement. So uh, we are having some more talks, uh, which are going to be in our newsletter. So our Japan talk is actually going to be in two parts because there's just too much to cover in one talk. And uh, we're also having our Shanghai talk. And, uh, and we're also having a talk on the Venice Biennale uh, by uh, Dr. Nick Gordon. Uh, so all this will be on our website and in our next newsletter. So we're looking forward to seeing you all again. Um, 
tell your friends um, because one of the good things about these Zoom talks is that there's no limit on numbers and uh, we can actually uh, address many more people than we can um, at home uh, in our place. Uh, and um, But you do have to make your own uh, egg sandwiches, I'm sorry. Okay, all the best. See you later. Bye.